this uh, la latest session of Eagle Talk, and I have with me Guy Fitty Sinclair and Jan Klabers, and they are not going to talk about the specific article, but the symposium that both of them convened on theorizing international organizations law. So perhaps by way of introduction, I recently contributed to a book uh, edited by Jeff Dunoff and Mark Pollock on theories of international law generally. And it had a very rich table of content, positive law, natural law, feminist approaches, sociological approaches, constitutionalism and international law. And yet, as you point out, if one would look for a similar venture in the area of international organizations law, one would come up practically empty. And the approach that you took by focusing on the work of six authors is perhaps a result of that, that it's, there's no established, here are the different schools of international organizations law theory. But even if one looks at the authors, with perhaps the exception of uh, Hans Kelsen, they're not really doing international organizations law theory. If we look at our Bible, uh, uh, Henry Skirmers and Blocker, it's more like, and I say this with great appreciation, it's more like a manual of the law of international organizations rather than a theoretical reflection, a theory of international organizations law. How do you explain this? I have a few ideas about that, which may not be very um, elaborate yet. But one, one is that international organizations tend to be very slippery creatures, but we can't really fundamentally understand them. They're partly made by states, but they're also not part of states and what states do. Uh, I think that's complicating things. There, there's a bunch of them in existence, so there's a lot of opportunity for practice rather than for um, thinking things through, perhaps. And maybe what doesn't help is that we tend to approach them from a, a more or less classical international law perspective where all things international are the result of cooperation between states. And that creates perhaps a path dependency that we have had great problems coming to terms with. But it's difficult to think of organizations in terms any other than being creatures of states. And that that sort of constantly throws up roadblocks for what it's worth. But if, okay. if, I, can pu if I can push you a little bit on this, uh, mm -hmm. there's one outlier. Uh, if we look at the European Union, and of course some theorists of European Union law would say, no, 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 don't include us among international organizations. We are sui generis, we are different. But it also has this kind of slippery nature, uh, member states, uh, the European Union itself. And yet that's the one exception to your generalization, because there's a rich approaches, theoretical approaches, not only to the European Union, but to European Union law. And the contribution of lawyers there to the various theories has been capital. So why is it different for other international organizations? Because the EU is by far the most uh, different, the most sui generis, amongst sui generis um, entities, I guess. And in, in a sense, what doesn't help is that there are very few organizations that are alike. So that they're all sui generis which means that that label is not particularly helpful, perhaps with respect to the EU, but that's a different story. But they are so wildly divergent, conservative estimate would hold there's about 300 of them and no two are alike, or, or maybe every now and then you run into something that's fairly similar to something else. But the variety is so wide that as soon as you think you have a handle on a general concept, you, you'll notice a couple of dozen that don't fit the general concept. So then you're back at square one. Yes, I, so I think I would agree with that. I think um, part of the difficulty is um, the, the extreme diversity of international organizations. I think perhaps there was a moment somewhere around 1945 when the specialized agencies were being created, when it was possible to look at uh, one dozen or two dozen international organizations and identify a number of common features and say this is what we're talking about as international organizations. But they've proliferated so much in the decades since then, and in so many different ways, you know, they, they exercise such different kinds of powers and have different kinds of structures, 
that in a way this is a this is an inhibition on general theorizing. So you, you do find a lot of things written about the European Union, possibly because it has such um, far-reaching powers. And you find a lot of books about United Nations and even sort of a carving out of United Nations law, because we think of that as the general international organization and its its breadth of activity also perhaps attracts attention. But apart from that, it becomes difficult to say something universal along any particular dimension about all international organizations. You chose to look at six authors. Maybe you want to mention them and briefly explain your choice. Why those six authors? Why not five well, or seven? Uh, <laughs> well, this, 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 the number six is fairly random, I guess. Schermers was an obvious candidate precisely because of the Bible you just mentioned, the, the International Institutional Law book that he started in the 1970s and that is now in its sixth edition with Niels Blocker. And that is literally, that is the handbook, the treatise, the manual that all of us have on our desks constantly. Um, I thought Paul Reuter, or Reuter, never know how to pronounce that, um, was would be an interesting choice because of his practical involvement in the creation of the European Community for Coal and Steel. Uh, Kelsen, yeah, Kelsen is Kelsen, but uh, that's, you, you can hardly not include Kelsen, I would think. Then we have Jenks, who stands, uh, well, well, Guy knows better than that. You want to take over, Guy? Yeah, so Jenks w was um, an international lawyer working for his whole career in the International Labour Organization. What I argue in, in, in the article that I contributed to the symposium is that he is something of a pivotal figure in establishing the discipline of international organizations law after um, uh, after the Second World War. One more is um, uh, Georges Abissab, who is, in a, in a sense, stands in for a kind of a third world or global south perspective on international organizations, although there's, of course, great diversity among uh, third world authors on international organizations. Um, and then we have Louis Stone, who, in a sense, stands in for uh, the American tradition uh, of, of on international organizations law. So I think to take a step back, our idea was that we wanted to go back to what we saw as the foundational period of international organizations law in the decades immediately following the Second World War, and um, look at what we thought would be not entirely arbitrary, somewhat selected group of key thinkers who helped to establish the discipline in that period. And our reason was that we look around the world today, we look at our discipline or our subdiscipline of international organizations law, and there's no question it's in a kind of a, a crisis that um, international organizations themselves are constantly in crises, of course, but the, the subdiscipline of international organizations law seems to be unable to, to, in some ways, to grapple with the real problems thrown up by international organizations, especially as they impact on the lives of individuals and communities. And so our initial sort of conceit or conception was that if we go back to the, that foundational period and um, unearth and somehow reanalyze some of those um, foundational theorists in perhaps in, in scare quotes, we might find some of the root causes of the problems of the discipline today. And on the other hand, we might find some threads that were not taken up and that would help us find a way out of those problems. It's kind of uh, strange to find you talking about a uh, crisis when we see such proliferation. It seems as if crisis or not, there's a great appetite for more and more international organizations of uh, various kinds. Who knows how many organizations COVID will breed? So in what sense do you actually say crisis? Uh, Jan? <laughs> well, no, I, th I, think, I think you're right in suggesting that, that the term crisis is not so much related to the creation of international organizations. A couple of years ago, the, the new Pope, Pope Francis, delivered his first encyclical and suggested that the problems of world poverty and climate change could be solved by setting up another international organization, which suggests that um, our political imagination is fairly limited. We tend to think either uh, of, of creating states or if we need a, something bigger than that, something transboundary, then 
the international organization is the most obvious solution. So whenever there's an international problem, we think of an organization. That means that in that sense, there's not much of a crisis. The crisis lies elsewhere. And I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to use crisis talk, but uh, since we're using that vocabulary, we might as well go on. I think the crisis is more a crisis of understanding. Um, the, this symposium has a backstory further. You might recall that a few years ago, I wrote the EGIL forward on the transformation of international organizations law, where to put it in summary fashion, I basically stated that we're all functionalists. And that means that we're all locked in thinking about international organizations as they relate to their member states, which is fine for some purposes, but does not get you very far when the organization is exercising uh, territorial administration, for instance, because then the, the victims or those on the receiving end of international organizations action are not member states, but are individuals or companies. You see the same with uh, the Haiti cholera affair, where a bunch of people, a number of people, a large number of people died. You, you cannot really analyze that anymore in terms of function and uh, the role of member states and, and all that. So we were wondering, and, and Guy took me to task for that. He said, well, you might be exaggerating that we're all functionalists. Maybe there are other strands of thought in, in the literature from the 50s, 60s, 70s which suggests that there might be other uh, intellectual resources to draw upon. So then we sat down and started to think maybe we should do something with that idea. Like, am I exaggerating when I say we're all functionalists? Or are there other possibilities? And you'll notice in, in, in the articles in the symposium that quite a few of them, in, in different ways perhaps, but quite a few reach beyond the purely functional idea the purely functionalist idea and insert in their authors or in their readings of the authors that they discuss elements of constitutional thought or of public law thinking. Like Paul Reuter had very clear ideas, uh, according to Evelyn Lagrange, about the need for secondary law of international organizations, which he borrowed from EU law, no doubt. Or I think he developed that after the, the, the EU institutions were created or the EU was created. But that, that would be a clear example of trying to find a way beyond and above the purely functional approach um, to find intellectual resources to come to terms with the circumstance that international organizations no longer solely interact with their member states. That proposition was probably tenable, somewhat tenuously perhaps, until World War II, but thereafter with the rise of the individual, with the rise of notions of direct effect and all that. You can't really make that stick anymore. And yet that is where much of the academic work on international organizations hits the roadblock because it gets stuck in the loop of functionalist thinking. That makes so sense? It does make sense. But here are two related, uh, two related questions. Uh, is there really a need or place for specific theorizing on international organizational law or theorizing by international lawyers on international organization? Since it's a holistic phenomenon, shouldn't the approach be what could lawyers contribute to the general IR theories of international organizations? And the other side of the coin is you mentioned correctly, of course, that there's no dearth of theorizing of international organization among international relations scholars. Are they missing something by not taking into account the legal dimensions? Because, for example, that was the phenomenon of the earlier stages of theorizing the European Union. The political theorists and political scientists which were looking at the European Union, if you read those works from the 50s, 60s, and even 70s, it's as if law did not matter, whereas we know that law is a hugely important part of the ontology of the European Union. Is there something similar where you could say, yes, the IR has done a lot of work, but what is lacking in their work is serious attention to international law or to international organization law? I, I would say, yes, you can say that, that their work generally lacks serious attention for international organizations law. And, and that's 
irregardless of the merits it may have in its own terms and uh, in its own uh, discipline. Could you give us one example where it matters? Here is a IR theory of international organization and it might have been different if the scholar would have taken into account the importance of international organization and law. Well, here is one example, a recent study produced by, uh, by leading IR scholars, Lisbeth Hoge, Tobias Lenz, Gary Marx, called A Theory of International Organization, which suggests it, it, it's, it's a brilliant piece of rational scholarship or rationalist scholarship. But for instance, it completely omits the implied powers doctrine. It aims to sketch a balance between concerns of function on the one hand and community or uh, sociality, as they sometimes call it, on the other hand, uh, which makes perfect sense. But the lawyer would have realized that the very existence of the implied powers doctrine since 1949 and probably before, actually since the 1920s, is precisely to manage that tension between the function, the idea of doing something together on the one hand and protecting the sovereign state and its people on the other hand. And that's the sort of thing where a legal uh, analysis would add a lot to that sort of scholarship. So I, I think another area where you see a certain scarcity or lacuna in IO theory, which probably derives from a deep-seated traditional skepticism about international law itself, is on the accountability issue. Because uh, if you look at the work of Guy Fitty Sinclair himself, if you look at global administrative law, they do make law, which has a huge impact on the lives of individuals, on the conduct of states, etc. And that immediately throws up the question of what is the legitimacy of that lawmaking? Where's the accountability to that decisional process? Which were, and you don't find too much of that issue troubling the international relations theories. Can I ask Guy a question? If a, if a young scholar was to uh, read your symposium and say, give me a menu of issues, of approaches that I might take uh, if I wanted to enter the field and write something of significance theorizing international organizational law. Can you give us just a, a few examples of what might be such a research agenda? Well, uh, given the vast... Uh diversity of international organizations that we've been talking about, I mean, th there are as many potential agendas or, or more than there are international organizations. So, of course, I, I think a lot could be gained from studying specific international organizations, particularly those which are relatively uh, uh, understudied. So, for example, this year, suddenly everybody is an, is becoming or quickly becoming an expert on the World Health Organization. Uh, uh, 12 months ago, there was hardly an international organization around who knew what the World Health Organization was, what it did, how its powers worked, uh, whether it had any accountability mechanisms, uh, and so on. So it seems like you know, there are many international organizations that could do with a closer examination. There have been studies, you, you know, if you go back 40 years, 50 years, there are some, some good studies of, say, the specialized agencies, the technical agencies, but they haven't been but kept up to date. I was going to say, isn't that a little bit self-defeating? Because that's almost as if rising the white flag and saying there's no potential for a general theory of international organizational law. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, I, I mean, of course, that could be done in a way that relates those uh, particular powers to to bigger themes in, in theory and, uh, you know, cross-cutting themes in international organizations law. I mean, another approach, uh, I mean, there are, there are many. So another approach would be to re, uh, revisit some of these uh, earlier authors, uh, try to reconsider how um, uh, early scholars of international organizations understood or international organizations law understood their subject. Um, uh, you, you know, this sort of historical intellectual history approach, which we have undertaken here. Um, and then I think there's actually a huge amount of work that needs to be done on the relationships between international organizations. Often, even in books on international organizations law, 
international organizations are treated as if they are islands you know, operating on their own. When in fact, uh, my sense is that much, uh, much the majority of what international organizations do is in collaboration, sometimes in competition with other international organizations um, uh, and other you know, public, private, hybrid bodies and so on. And I, I think that would be a, a very promising area of inquiry for, for somebody starting out. Jan, what do you, would be your number one, two, and three pet research questions to a young researcher <laughs> entering the field of theorizing uh, international organizational law? No, the, the, the number one question would be indeed, uh, what's not an, well, yes, in terms of empirical questions, that would be, uh, I, I share Guy's sentiment that a lot of work can be done, needs to be done on the interaction between international organizations. Um, Jeff Dunoff has done a few nice articles the last couple of years, but he's one of the very few that has, um, and then there's Evelyn Lagrange who has developed uh, principles that could be applicable in relations between international organizations. But there's very little work done generally on that. Uh, as for theorizing, the, the, the thing I'm exploring myself at the moment um, is to focus on the second word of our uh, pair of terms. The international organizations are usually considered to be international. That's what we focus on. But we rarely focus on them as organizations. Once you start to do that, and you start to realize that much like other organizations, like your domestic fire department or the League of European Research Universities or whatever, international organizations tend to do three things. They, um, they regulate, they manage, and in doing so, they allocate costs and benefits. And once you look at them from that perspective, a whole new world opens up and that might be of interest, that might be fruitful. That's, that's where I'm heading myself at the moment, um, with, with great enthusiasm. can hardly wait to, uh, to get seriously started. Um, but yeah, w within the existing framework, the relations between international organizations, definitely. And then there is, um, like we tend to focus, uh, very understandably perhaps, we tend to focus on a handful of organizations that we study, that we write books about, and the other 280 or 305 or whatever many it is, depends how you count, they are left behind. No, no one writes about uh, the International Maritime Organization or the International Civil Aviation Organization or uh, UNHCR has written about the International Organization for Migration, considerably less written about. I'm sure you've managed to insult a few people right now. Nobody has written about this or that and somebody's hopping bad i wrote no, a whole book about of course it <laughs> it yeah well it's it's of course but but uh, there is work on aviation law but there is not much work i won't say nobody but there's not much work on the institution called international civil aviation organization uh from the top of my head the last monograph was written in the 60s um and, and that applies to a considerable amount of organizations I think Michael Reisman once pointed out that international lawyers tend to look for their lost keys under the street light, regardless if they lost the key in that street or in a dark alley. And something similar is going on here, perhaps, that we tend to look for things in places where we know we can find something rather than looking for stuff that might be more tricky to find. So that would be like if you're a young scholar, you want to make a name for yourself, write about stuff that other people don't write about. It might be also the proclivity of lawyers to look at the pathological when there's a conflict and not at the physiognomical, just mm -hmm. how things function, etc. Yep. I'm afraid we have to be drawing yep. this to a close. Uh, so I will allow each of you to make, quote, one large statement, uh, a cri de coeur. Okay. Now, my, my cri de coeur would be, let's start to focus on the organization part of the term international organizations like they're not just manifestations of international cooperation or they're there that too but the organizational form must have some relevance why not otherwise conclude a treaty or set up a congress or an alliance or something there must be a reason why 
states and, and, and perhaps others set up international organizations and give them that specific form. So maybe it's, it's a nice idea to start exploring that. Would that work as a cri de coeur? Absolutely. And you, Guy? Well, perhaps not a cri de coeur, but um, just to go back to your question earlier about what do international lawyers have to add to theory that hasn't already been said about internet, uh, by international relations uh, theorists, I would just say, um, I would point you know, people who might be interested in that question to one of the contributions to the symposium, which is uh, Umut Ozu's uh, uh, article on Georges Abissar's very small book on the uh, United Nations operation in the Congo. And I think that book by Georges Abissar uh, is just a, a, a fantastic illustration of how international, uh, international lawyers can analyze the workings of international organizations in a way that I think goes beyond anything that any uh, political scientist has written about. Uh, and there's been many books about the, the Congo operation and the Congo crisis. But Abi Saab's analysis of the subtle uses of law, specifically by um, Doug Hammarskjöld, in that operation, is really fantastic. It stands the test of time, and I think to go to your question about uh, inspiring young scholars, I think rereading that book would be an inspiration. I think we owe it to the authors of the symposium that you mentioned. Who are the authors who have actually done the the work by looking at these particular scholars? Maybe you could just tell us. Yeah, so I just mentioned um, Umut Ozu, who, who wrote on George Abisab. We have an article by Ian Johnstone on Louis Sohn. We have Evelyn Larange on Paul Reuter. We have uh, Jochen von Bernstorff on Kelsen and Kunz. Uh, of course, we have uh, Jan Klubbers on Skirmers and myself on uh, Wilfred Jenks. So thank you both very much. And to our viewers and listeners, the symposium is out. And it's not only intrinsically interesting, this kind of historical look and the foundational periods, etc., but it's really very stimulating as new areas for inquiry and research. So warmly recommended to take a look at the symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.